Sure, go right ahead. Okay. Well, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, or any time you might be around the globe. So I would like to welcome everybody to the first online TCBG seminar this semester. Uh, we had a major interruption due to the situation with the COVID-19, but uh, fortunately we were able to resume this good seminar series with, uh, with an, in an online format. And um, uh, it's my great pleasure actually to introduce the first speaker of this series, uh, Professor Bert de Groot from the Max Planck Institute of Biophysical Chemistry who will give us the seminar today. Before I introduce actually Bert, uh, I would like to point out a few etiquette items uh, for our seminar today. It's a, it's a Zoom webinar, obviously it has its own challenges and hopefully we can work together to make it a successful seminar. So you will all be or have been promoted to panelists which means you can turn on your mic and you can turn on your video. I would suggest that when we start, you all turn off your microphones so you don't interfere with the audio. And during the presentation, you can keep your video on if your connection allows that, that's okay. And I even actually encourage you during the Q&A, question and answer session, maybe to turn on the video to have a little bit more interactive discussion with the, with the speaker and with the rest of the group. So similar to the way we traditionally have our theoretical computation of biophysics seminars, sitting in the same room, interacting with the speaker. If you prefer, turn on your camera. Obviously you have to turn on your mic to ask the question. So uh, let's keep that for the, for the Q&A session. Questions and answers should be actually best paste it into the Q&A tab at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So that way with the host and co-host have control on them, can see them, can actually move them around or sort of mark them as answered and go through them uh, during the seminar even if necessary, if there is an urgent question, we can actually bring it up during the seminar. And I hope that the speaker doesn't mind being no. interrupted a couple of times during the seminar for that. No worries. So yes, thank you. Thanks, Brett. So yeah, put pace your questions and the, the more descriptive, the better. Very likely I or other hosts will ask you to repeat the question when it comes time. But, and then at that point, you can actually turn on your camera and the microphone and ask your question. So that's what we're planning to do. But you'll see, depends on the number of questions that will be posed. So uh, for now, I would suggest that again, everybody turn off the microphones. Uh, videos are okay. If your connection allows that, we can keep it on. Uh, uh, but let me actually move now to introducing our speaker oh, today. One, one thing I should say, well, I'm sorry, I apologize. We're, uh, we're also, for those on audio only, we are recording this. So okay. folks didn't know we're recording it. Excellent, thank you. Thanks, Barry. So it is really my great pleasure to introduce our today's seminar speaker. Bertu Groot from uh, Max Planck Institute for Biophysical Chemistry in Göttingen, a sort of major simulation um, kind of center in Europe, I would say. So by way of introduction, Bert is a native of the Netherlands and he did actually his initial preparation in this field at two major sites in Europe. Initially he studied chemistry at, uh, at Groningen in, in the Netherlands, uh, and he was supervised by uh, <clears throat> uh, Professor Berensen, who is actually a famous figure, a known figure, a major figure in Europe uh, on biomolecular and molecular simulation in general. Uh, he stayed there and he completed his PhD with uh, Berensen around the same time. Uh, uh, where he started actually working on protein dynamics during this time. And this is uh, a long time ago. Uh, so, but, the, but then he moves actually from the Netherlands to, um, to the group of Helmut Grubmuller at Max Planck Institute in uh, Göttingen, where he started actually, he started overlapping a lot, but I remember the time they were working both on aquaponic water channels, mm -hmm. kind of uh, in the US and Europe. So that was the subject. So that moved him more closer to membrane proteins around that time. Uh, and then since 2004, actually he stayed at the same institute and he has been heading the computational biomolecular dynamics group at Max Planck in Göttingen. Uh, 
uh, and he uh, uh, he also joined the physics faculty as a professor in 2009 at the University of Göttingen. So Bert uh, has really significant overlap with what we are interested in and what we do in Urbana. So he is interested in large scale simulation of complex biomolecular systems, um, algorithmic development, uh, protein structure, dynamic function relationship in general, reduced dimensionality problem, how to actually analyze very complex molecular systems in an understandable manner, integrating experimental information into models and simulations and uh, connecting experiment and computation in general. And also he is actually very well known in uh, using and developing uh, algorithms in Gromax. So we have a lot of uh, common interests uh, and that's why we invited him to give us a seminar. He finally accepted. Uh, uh, and uh, we look forward to your seminar Bert, today, please. Yeah, thanks very much for this nice introduction. And um, um, yeah, I um, agree that there are many common interests. Um, I'll not be talking about any membrane proteins sure. today. Um, that's one topic that probably we have the most common interest in, but uh, mm -hmm. you specifically asked to for once talk about something else. So that's um, uh, very much welcome. So today I'll um, uh, share some thoughts on the work we do on alchemical free energy calculations. Mm -hmm. And I should really point out that this is mostly the work of um, Vitas Gapsis, who is um, uh, a project leader in the group, so uh, really all the credit should be going to him. Mm -hmm. um, right, so what are um, uh, free energy calculations? Well, I guess you all know that, so um, I, I'm not going to give um, uh, much introduction here, but just as a reminder, of course, there are many different flavors of free energy calculations because you know, free energies are so of such central importance that um, many different methods have been developed to, to capture them and they go from from purely statistical base. So um, yeah, chem informatics, for example, here, and there are hybrid methods like, um, um, well, the well-known example is Rosetta or, or MMPBSA methods. And then uh, what we call first principles based, not because it's based on, on the first principles of quantum mechanics, but more on the first principles of, of statistical mechanics. And um, if one is lucky, one can just from a, a long equilibrium MD simulation, of course, count the probabilities of visiting a state, apply the Boltzmann formulism to get free energy. Typically, we're not that lucky. We run into some sort of sampling issue and therefore uh, require biased sampling. And then um, again, there's different methods. Uh, one can use enhanced sampling. Uh, I learned that many of you are using uh, metadynamics. Um, another possibility would be umbrella sampling. Mm -hmm. uh, those are all equilibrium methods to, to assess free energies. You can choose non-equilibrium methods based on Yersinski or Crookes. And the other um, sort of branch here is, uh, is the alchemical branch. And I'll talk mostly about that today. And again, there's equilibrium, so the um, classical uh, perturbation or thermodynamic integration techniques. And again, today I'll uh, focus on another branch where, where uh, also here one can apply non-equilibrium formalisms and, and we'll talk mostly about um, uh, Crookes fluctuation theorem today. So um, for those who don't know, or for a, a reminder for all the others, what is um, um, an alchemical free energy calculation or, or why would one want to do that? Well, suppose um, as one example, um, I get the internet connection cable. Can you all hear me well? I don't have access to the chat as long as I'm sharing. The screen, yes, so yes, it, actually, we can hear you. It, the, it, sometimes it gets a little sort of broken, but it's fine. OK, so mm -hmm. just interrupt me if, um, sure. if it gets uh, funny. Sure. Um, 
So just suppose you're looking at um, at the process like um, ligand binding to a protein. You could um, approach this with metadynamics or umbrella sampling and look at the actual binding unbinding process that would arguably be the most direct way to, to simulate the um, experimental process. Um, but one can, of course, also realize that um, all the in-between states um, of partial binding and so are not of primary interest frequently. Yeah, if one is just interested in the delta G of binding, then the whole um, process of binding, including you know, a possible uh, free energy barrier that might be cumbersome to pass and so, is actually not of prime interest. So uh, in that case, we would just be interested in the, in the difference between the bound and the unbound state. And this is where alchemical free energy calculations come in. Just think of the following um, thermodynamic cycle. So we're again interested in this binding process. Um, but instead of you know, simulating this actual binding unbinding, we can also um, consider, um, well, what if we are not only interested in this ligand A, but we are actually interested in, so is ligand B a better or a worse binder? Um, so in a relative affinity, yeah? so just in the difference in affinity between ligand A and ligand B. In that case, we could also um, think of the free energy difference between A and B in the unbound state, um, as well as in the bound state. And now the nice thing about thermodynamics is that um, um, this actually gives us access to the answer we're interested in, because instead of the difference between the, um, these horizontal lags here, the uh, difference in binding affinity. We can also look at the difference of this sort of transformation free energy A into B between the unbound and the bound state. And um, um, that amounts to exactly the same as the difference between these two um, horizontal legs. And that is because the you know, free energy is a thermodynamic state variable. So it doesn't matter if we go from here to here to here or if we um, uh, would have gone via this state, uh, it should always end up with the same answer. Also, if we uh, close the cycle, so we end up in the, in the state that we started from, we always end up at zero. And that means that the difference between the vertical legs, it must be the same as the difference between the horizontal legs. So just by morphing A into B, in the unbound state, doing the same in the bound state, taking the difference between the two, gives us the access to the binding free energy without ever, ever having simulated an actual binding process. Um, so that's just one example of such a thermodynamic cycle. Um, and, and exactly these um, vertical lags are then um, uh, the alchemical transformations that, for example, can be computed by thermodynamic integration. Another example of such a thermodynamic cycle would be if we're interested in uh, the effect of a mutation, say on the folding um, free energy of a protein. Um, in experiment, we would be looking at, at uh, in this case, at the vertical lag, so the folding unfolding transition. Well, this is difficult to simulate, of course. Uh, but again, we can apply the same trick. We can do the mutation alchemically once in the unfolded state, once in the folded state, and get the uh, difference in folding free energy due to the mutation uh, in, by an alchemical means. Um, now, how does this work um, technically? Well, the traditional way to do this is um, by, uh, for example, thermodynamic integration. Um, so we have this alchemical morph between two states, A and B, we define a, um, um, a coordinate called lambda, typically as uh, defined as zero in the A state and as one in the B state. And um, in the molecular dynamics engine, we um, um, define then a gradient of the Hamiltonian with respect to lambda. Um, uh, so basically um, a force acting on this um, lambda coordinate and if we now um, 
uh, slowly, gradually go from zero to one. So we switch the, the molecule from A to B um, and integrate um, this, this um, DHD lambda, we get our actual free energy. Um, now we need to do this very slowly um, because we uh, the thermodynamic integration or also free energy perturbation requires us to be at equilibrium at all time. Uh, but uh, other than that, it is actually rigorous. Um, now, um, other people might realize that another way to, to write this, of course, is um, delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. Um, and you might think, okay, where this, is this T delta S term now? Because do you, don't you only have the uh, delta H term here? Um, no, this is not the case. Um, maybe a, a small thing for you to think about in the meantime, and um, happy to discuss that also afterwards. Uh, but this is fully rigorous uh, with the only constraint being that we should be in equilibrium at all times. Um, but there is also an, uh, a way to circumvent this and actually do this um, uh, in a non-equilibrium way. So where we apply the exact same uh, formalism, but actually make these transitions very fast. And this is where the Crookes fluctuation theorem comes in. Um, so what we do here is uh, we do an uh, um, equilibrium simulation in the A state and we do an equilibrium uh, simulation for the B state. So here called mutants. Um, and what we then do, instead of one slow uh, transition from A to B um, uh, with this lambda coordinate, we do this um, very fast, but many times. And we do this many times from A to B, taking snapshots from the A ensemble and going to B. And we also do it um, in the reverse direction from B to A. And like in the um, thermodynamic integration case, um, we can um, um, compute this integral. Now it's not the delta G, but we call it W for work because we do it fast. So we, we are not in equilibrium and therefore this integral is, contains a delta G contribution, but it also contains dissipated heat. So we have both of them in this work value. But the nice thing uh, about the Crookes fluctuation theorem is that, that there is a possibility to extract the um, free energy difference. And that is if we extract these work values for the forward and for the reverse direction, uh, we get the distribution for both. And where they overlap, um, this is actually an estimate for our delta G via um, um, this relationship over here. And this is actually quite remarkable because it gives us um, access from a set of non-equilibrium work values where these actually match. So where this probability becomes one, the work value actually uh, matches the delta G estimate. And that's what we use um, uh, in, in our kind of calculations. Um, this is how it might look in practice. So we collect many, many different snapshots from an equilibrium simulation and do a, a forward transition for each of them. So these are the different forward uh, work values in green, uh, the same uh, for reverse in blue, and get the histogram uh, from both, and um, where our estimated um, overlap lies is our delta G estimate. Now, this is a case where everything worked rather well. Um, so we have nice histograms. Um, so we have a, um, uh, a well-converged estimate of our overlap and um, um, also the equilibrium simulations behave well. There's not, no direct trends uh, visible or something like that. Now, um, why would one um, want to do these kind of non-equilibrium simulations instead of a, a plain um, TI workflow? Well, there's a number of advantages um, that, that um, uh, we see. Um, of course, like in any simulation, in principle, there is no free lunch. So um, 
the same sampling problems that you have in TI calculations, you will also have in, in non-equilibrium calculations, but the advantages are more of a technical nature. Um, one advantage is that um, we spend most of our simulation effort in these equilibrium runs. So these uh, non-equilibrium transitions are really very short. And that means the majority of the sampling and also of the computational effort is actually done in the physical ensembles and not in these unphysical intermediate lambda states. Um, so that's good for uh, post-processing, for example. Um, plus, we can also recycle our equilibrium runs. Um, yeah, imagine that you um, are doing many different branches of one ligand with many different derivatives, then we can always use the same um, equilibrium ensembles to start from and to branch off from and, and reuse those uh, equilibrium ensembles. Um, in those equilibrium ensembles, there is nothing um, free energy specific among them. So you can use the, the, the most optimized kernels and so on running on the GPU. Um, usually, whenever you switch on more and more free energy options, the code will run slower. At least this is the case for Chromax. Um, and of course, uh, also in these equilibrium runs, you can use enhanced sampling schemes. So you, if you would want, you could use replica exchange or, or metadynamics and um, enhance the sampling there. Uh, and from those um, runs, extract the snapshots for um, non-equilibrium. Of course, there is also drawbacks. Um, um, sometimes we run into issues with uh, a large number of small jobs. Some queuing systems don't like that very much. And um, if you are calibrating workflows due to this um, large number of jobs, it's also um, you know, uh, requires a little bit more thinking to do that in, a, in an efficient way. But OK, so um, now we have more or less the framework for how to do these kind of calculations. Um, a little bit on the implementation. So we use the PMX software that we apply and, and develop in the group. Um, you can access it both via a, a web server, and address is here. Um, and by now, we uh, support many different kinds of um, free energy calculations, um, protein mutations for uh, looking at protein stability or also protein um, 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 mutations uh, arising to, to um, for example, antibiotic resistance, uh, protein design. Uh, we support nucleic acid mutations and also ligand modifications for um, drug design, basically. Um, and today I'll give you three examples. So we'll start off with um, um, predicting the um, protein stability due to mutations, then uh, do an effort in the direction of protein design, and end with um, some examples of, of um, predicting relative binding affinities. Um, so let's start with protein thermostability. Uh, we're looking at the protein barnays, and um, uh, this has been studied extensively, also experimentally, so that's why we chose this. And so we look at um, mutations all over the protein, basically at, at 55 positions, and in total do 119 mutations there. We take this thermodynamic cycle that they um, talked about before. Um, so we do the mutation in the unfolded state, um, and we do a mutation in the folded state and take the delta delta G uh, from that. Um, and the way we do that in, in PMX is, um, um, I mean, there's only, if you have 20 amino acids, there's only uh, something like 200 mutations that you can do, or um, 400 um, if you take the whole matrix. And um, uh, so these can all be put in a library and, and that's what we have done. And that's also what we have available on the web server. So you can, um, um, I think there was a picture here. Yeah, so you can just say um, in any PDB file, 
what kind of residue you want to have um, uh, mutated, what you want to mutate it into, and go. Um, so that's what what is happening behind the screen. So you have um, uh, a state A. In this case, I guess it's an alanine, and the state D is a phenyl. And um, then this hybrid is built, which gradually morphs a um, uh, alanine side chains or methyl group into a, a phenyl group. Um, so um, um, this is what we have done, and we have and also modern force fields, um, and um, uh, this is the uh, workflow we chose. So 20 nanoseconds for the equilibrium runs, and 100 transitions each of uh, 50 picoseconds, and um, um, this is um, sort of the overall result. So it's a scatter plot of experimental versus um, calculated delta delta G. We get quite a reasonable correlation. Some outliers, of course. This is charm 36. Um, uh, so you get a correlation of 0.67. Uh, um, average unsigned error of um, uh, 3.8 kilojoules per mole. So this is slightly below one kcal per mole, which also means that the number of hits that we have in this, this shaded area, which is the one kcal per mole area, is something like 63%. Um, then, of course, it's interesting to see, do all force fields um, um, behave equally well? Um, so here we look at the um, average unsigned error uh, different amber variants, uh, the older OPLS all atom, um, charm 22 star, and um, uh, charm 36. And we sort of get um, quite similar uh, behavior of around 1 kcal per mole accuracy. Um, and uh, well, this is of course quite encouraging, but this is. Um, um, almost quantitative um, um, agreement between experiment and simulation. But of course, one wonders, so where do these differences between force fields come from? Do they all make the same errors, these different force fields? Or if they make different errors, then it might actually um, help to, to think of a, a consensus approach where we merge the results uh, that come from different force fields. And maybe that gives us an even better um, agreement. And this is exactly the case. So if we go to such a consensus approach, so these were the individual force fields we've looked at before. Um, uh, a consensus with some machine learning gives us actually the best uh, performance. So here something you know approaching like three kilojoules per mole. If we just do more simple averaging, that also already helps quite a bit. So the take home message is that um, um, different force fields actually make different errors. Yeah, sometimes one force field overestimates uh, the change, the other underestimates, and then averaging actually gives us uh, a result better to experiment. Um, here we also looked a little bit deeper into the sources of error. So from this, we already know that there must be a force field effect. And, and this is, in fact, um, the largest contribution. We also have a remaining sampling um, error. So if we do everything times 2 or times 10, this also reduces the error further. And of course, there is also experimental error. So um, for um, this is what we have here. So this is experiment versus experiment. The same mutation reported multiple times in the literature. And we see that, yes, the correlation is, um, uh, is very high, but there is also um, a remaining error. And uh, um, you know, the residual experimental error is also as large as, as 1.3 kilojoules per mole. So any simulation can never uh, be expected to beat that kind of um, um, accuracy, even if it were perfect. Okay. Um, 
I think that's all I wanted to mention on Barney's. Um, question arises, of course, how, uh, how, how generalizable is that? Does it work for other proteins as well? Um, here's two examples, um, staphylococcal nuclease and um, uh, a neurotensin receptor. So uh, this might be my only membrane protein in the, in the talk. <laughs> um, and uh, we see that in both cases, it, it works um, um, similarly well as in the Barnes case. So similar um, uh, accuracy correlation. And in the neurotensin case, uh, we also get quite a decent agreement to experiments. So also for membrane proteins in a, in a low dielectric, um, this, this mutation free energy seems to work um, uh, surprisingly well. Can I ask you a question? Uh, yeah. First? So I, in terms of uh, distributing the computational work between equilibrium portions of the simulation and the transition, is there a rough kind of uh, estimate you can provide? So you had some numbers, how many times you did the non-equilibrium part of the transition. And, but is there a kind of rule of thumb, how much you spend in and under equilibrium, how much you spend slowly going between the two states? I can imagine it, of course, depends on the protein and the process as well, but. Yeah, mm -hmm. but, um, and no, there is not really a, a, mm -hmm. a rule of thumb. So the, and the main reason is that it's 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 very difficult to answer beforehand how many mm -hmm. how much sampling you need overall. Yeah. So um, for mm -hmm. for any uh, conformational sampling, you you just don't know is hundred nanoseconds going to be sufficient or do I need a microsecond? That's um, that's true for any simulation project, and that's no different for um, a free energy simulation. I mean, for these non-equilibrium transitions, it's rather easy because um, uh, it a lot becomes already clear from from these histograms. So, if you have um, not done enough transitions, your you know your histograms are obviously going to be very um, um, uh, problematic. Yeah, because you, you cannot really um, estimate where they are going to overlap. If they are, if your transitions are too short, what you get is that the distributions are going to be further and further apart, uh, up to a point where they don't overlap anymore. So, if that happens, you know your transitions should be slower. Um, and then, if you see from the, um, if the result depends on on which equilibrium snapshots you. Um, extracted the, the data from. If you see a trend there, that might be a, a, mm -hmm. a good um, uh, indication that you need to to do more equilibrium sampling. Yeah, or you're you're drifting off in some unrealistic direction, maybe. Um, so those are the indicators to to look at. So there are a couple of other questions, Bert, on this. Uh, uh, if you don't mind, maybe it's a, it's not a bad time to ask. Sepper, you want to go ahead? and ask your question. Sure. Um, so I was wondering what is the non-equilibrium protocol to go from one equilibrium, equilibrium state to another one? I mean, is it simply just cha changing lambda with a very high rate? Because we do the same thing yeah. in FEP. So in FEP, we go from one state to another state, but the change in lambda is kind of a slow. So we equilibrate, you know, when we yeah. go from one lambda to another lambda, but then what is the difference? Like, you know, why does it's it exactly have- the same. Mm -hmm. It's exactly the same. So the, the, what um, you do slowly in, in thermodynamic integration, you do fast in non-equilibrium. So the exact same mm -hmm. code that you can use for TI, you can also mm -hmm. use for, for Crooks. Oh, okay, That's thank it. you. And Shashank? I think now my question doesn't make much sense uh, because I think I was a little bit confused with the Crooks fluctuation theorem. And uh, just, just, just to state my question, it was, uh, uh, it was along the lines of stiff spring approximation. Do you think, uh, does it play an important role here or did you observe any uh, dependence on it? No, well, our, our lambda is not connected via a spring. So if you wish, it's, um, it's an oh. infinitely stiff spring, like a, a constraint, not the restraint. Yeah. <laughs> and so we, we simply define lambda and in, in that analogy, this would be the, um, um, uh, sort of the 
potential of mean force, right? And um, um, uh, we'd, in this case, be looking at the, at the constraint force. So you would just set the coordinate and um, 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 instead of sort of weakly equilibrating it like you could do with a weak string, a spring or a stiff string, in this case, you just have it fixed and um, you gradually change it during the simulation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, so I think we have completed the part on um, uh, protein stability. So let's switch to um, protein design. Um, and I'd like to do that at the example of ubiquitin. So ubiquitin is, um, is a protein we've looked at previously in a combination with simulation and NMR. And what we realized is that um, if you look at ubiquitin in the protein data bank, you find it in complex with many different binding partners. Here's just a few of them. And um, in any of these uh, crystal structures of ubiquitin in complex with a binding partner, ubiquitin always adopts a slightly different conformation. And at that time we were interested to see, so do these different conformations that we see in different complexes, uh, how do they compare to what ubiquitin does free in solution? And it turns out that um, there's a lot of um, similarity between um, uh, these different crystal structures of ubiquitin in different complexes and uh, the ensemble um, uh, that ubiquitin samples free in solution. So this is a, a principal component overlay of the um, uh, crystal structures in black and um, uh, NMR solution structures in red. Um, that's what we call the EROS for, um, um, that was the protocol we use for the structure refinement. And as you can see from the principal component overlay, these ensembles um, share a lot of similarity, meaning that the different um, uh, structures that ubiquitin needs to adopt in these different crystal structures, so the, the black conformations, are already sampled free in solution as well. Uh, and in fact, um, uh, we see that in the NMR ensemble, but we also see that in simulated ensembles. So the question, of course, is um, uh, does this really mean that um, uh, conformational selection is is uh, sufficient for for ubiquitin to you know, um, um, you know find a position that is suitable to interact with a certain binding partner and then engage in this complex uh, well for that we of course also need to see what is the situation in the complex um, and that's what we see here uh, so these are the same PCA projections, but then for different complexes. Um, in red is always the free um, uh, ensemble. So that uh, samples both these open and closed states. So I should have pointed that out here. Um, in this um, PCA um, movie, this first principal component is an opening closing motion of what we call a pincer like uh, motion and ubiquitin adopts more open states as well as more closed states. And now in the complex, sometimes um, ubiquitin prefers uh, to be in a closed state. Sometimes it prefers to be in an open state. Um, free in solution, it can sample both open and closed. In some complexes, it can also open and close, so it's not really restricted, but actually in quite a few, it is restricted in either open or closed. And so that gave us the following idea. So apparently native ubiquitin has these two free energy minima, uh, open and closed, and can um, um, you know, form complexes with, with binding partners that require either a closed state or an open state. And But what if we now could um, design a mutant of ubiquitin that uh, would have a strong preference to be, say, in the open state, then uh, these kind of complexes could form like before, 
but these ones would be um, higher in free energy now and, and might not form anymore. So um, can we design something like that? So we alchemically screened many, many different mutants, 112. Um, none of them were touching the interface or so, but all were conservative mutations in the, in the protein core. And actually many of them don't have any effect whatsoever on the opening and closing, but a few um, uh, were predicted to stabilize the closed state and a few also uh, the same for the open state over here. And we made sure that we didn't destabilize the protein by too much. Yeah, with this protocol that I described before. And so um, before we were brave enough to suggest some of these mutations to our experimental collaborators, we also validated um, these uh, mutants by umbrella sampling. And so we computed the open closed um, free energy landscape. So the native wild type ubiquitin is always repeated here in blue. So the, two minima for open and closed. And then in red, we see the mutants where we had predicted they should stabilize the closed state. And this is actually confirmed for quite a few, not for all of them. Um, and uh, likewise for the open stabilizing mutants. So we see a few where this is uh, in fact um, um, confirmed a few others where this is not. And we think this is mostly because yeah, the umbrella something here took something like a hundred fold more computational effort. So that there's probably better sampling in the umbrella sampling than there was in the original alchemical screen. So that's why not all of these uh, predicted mutations were confirmed, but we now have quite a few where we are confident that um, um, they have an effect on the open closing. So let's see how they behave in the complexes. And uh, remember that this is the picture that we have in mind. So we are now looking at complexes where we are going to test the hypothesis. Did we affect the uh, complex formation? And uh, in particular, uh, we expect a number of categories, right? We expect this category here where we have um, compatible binding. And so um, this would be a, a mutant uh, ubiquitin that would have a, an unaffected binding. This would be a mutant with a, a destabilized binding. And then we also have complexes uh, or mutants that are fine with either state and they should also be uh, not affected. So this is our control group, if you wish. Um, so let's see. Um, um, first, we look at the uh, compatible binder. So uh, exactly the, the uh, mutant is, is compatible with the binding partner. We see um, a small effect on the predicted uh, binding affinity. Then we switch to our control group. So either the mutant or the binding partner is, is, um, is, is compatible both with open and closed. Again, as expect a small uh, effect on the affinity and we see a small effect. And then uh, this is the interesting group of incompatible um, binders. So an open mutant that uh, wants to bind to a, a closed preferring binding partner and vice versa. And here um, we see a strong effect indeed on the binding. So a strong destabilization and um, uh, uh, well, with one exception, but here we have actually uh, destabilized the complex. Um, so how does this uh, then compare to experiments? So um, uh, a few of these mutants were then tested by NMR titration. So we have our predictions in, in green and in purple, both based on the conformational shift alone, as well as on the calculated delta delta G. Uh, and then the experiment is in orange and we see overall quite a nice um, um, uh, correlation. So for those two mutants, we expect no or a very small effect. And we also see that experimentally. Whereas for these two mutants, we expect um, uh, we expected the large destabilization. And this is also what we see experimentally. So um, here we have um, 
introduced a conformational shift in a, in a small protein and with that um, introduced a, a change in, in binding affinity. Right, um, as the next um, 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 application, I'd like to switch topics. Uh, and the final chapter I wanna um, mention is um, protein ligand binding. So here we um, cannot use libraries anymore of um, um, so sort of pre-listed um, uh, mutations, yeah, because it could be any arbitrary ligand that we change into any other ligand. But it requires a little bit of a different approach, but this is now also implemented in PMX. And in fact, the idea to do this is um, already uh, goes back to this this pioneering work by by Peter Coleman and colleagues at the uh, end of the 1980s, uh, where they uh, computed um, uh, with with an alchemical approach a, a single free energy value for a protein inhibitor complex, and it took something like um, yeah almost 30 years before this has become. Um, mainstream and, and affordable. And, and so this is one example from the Schrodinger team uh, where, where um, uh, this was then scaled to um, um, uh, 300 values. And this is um, basically where, where we uh, started as well. Um, so uh, we look at 11 different um, receptors and uh, something like 500 um, delta delta Gs. So where we do a ligand modification and predict the effect on the affinity. And here is what we get. Um, so the, the raw results experiment versus calculation are shown here at the bottom for, but this is the reference from um, Schrodinger FEP plus, and this is what we do in PMX in different force fields, so that's the uh, Guff amber force field um, here, um, and then we have the charm CGen of F, and then we also form a consensus. Um, a little bit more digestible is um, how you see it here in these overall diagrams, like like we looked at before. Um, um, average unsigned error and correlation, um, and um, um, uh, we see that we reach uh, um, again a, an accuracy of around 1 kcal per mole, both for FP plus and for um, PMX with GAF. CGNFF is slightly lower accuracy and the consensus again um, uh, puts us very close uh, again to the um, uh, with slightly outperforming GAF. So it gives gives us results very close to, to FP plus, OPLS3. Um, in correlation, uh, um, a very similar uh, result. Um, so this is good news because, you know, the Schrodinger protocol has been optimized for years to yield this kind of accuracy. And this is what we got at the, you know, out of the box, the very first go. Um, of course, we can uh, look at it in a little bit more detail. So we can uh, look at the uh, at all the data. So this is what we've looked at before. We can look at the original um, uh, data set from the Schrodinger Jacks paper. Um, um, a very similar overall result here. PMX maybe does slightly better. Um, and if we focus solely on the new data sets that have been added since 2015, uh, we see that FEP plus does a little bit better on those. Um, we can look at the individual receptors and there actually we see quite a large scatter. So we see um, cases that do very, very well, uh, like this uh, JNK1 kinase, for example. Um, um, but then there's other cases, yeah, like uh, this MCL1, where we actually see um, uh, uh, quite a bit more scatter. So here we have a larger uncertainty and also a lower accuracy. Um, we can also 
plotted as a um, um, function of the delta delta g range. So, um, you know, depending on how much um, the delta g is affected. Um, so, uh, if we look at um, um, the uh, a range of very small modifications here, all methods do sort of um, equally well in terms both of, of correlation and average error. Um, the more um, 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 destabilizing or the more stabilizing a modification gets, um, the worse our PMX approach seems to do. And whereas um, um, FP plus is not affected so much and actually does um, uh, quite well in comparison. So FP plus appears to be better in predicting large delta delta G changes where PMX tends to be somewhat more conservative. Um, and so we're still investigating why that might be. Might be because of the, um, um, uh, that we use non-equilibrium um, um, and, and therefore um, uh, are undersampling some of our um, uh, changes uh, that might be even more the case because uh, we don't use any enhanced sampling, whereas the FP plus package uses um, a solute tempering uh, replica exchange. Um, yeah, so this is the same um, uh, results that we've looked at before, but then summarize. So here are the individual receptors. Uh, and we see quite a, a large scatter in, in performance. So some um, uh, uh, cases, yeah, like uh, Galactin or JNK1, they do rather well. Um, some of them actually surprisingly well, you know, getting accuracies of, of close to one kilojoule per mole, uh, in this case in, in FFP+. Um, and then other cases that are more problematic and, and um, um, yeah, we also, in, in a number of cases, have um, a quite a good idea what it might be due to. Yeah, so it could be that there's dimerization involved, for example, or it could be that there's protonation state ambiguities involved, and, and all of these things lead, of course, to inaccuracies in, in these kind of um, uh, predictions. And yeah, um, just a little bit of shameless advertising. So with this um, PMX library that, that we have made available for, for uh, these kind of alchemical transformations in, in Bromax, uh, we have a completely open source software for alchemical transformations, including ligands, I support multiple force fields, which is actually a, a plus because combining force fields uh, helps to get um, um, uh, improved results, and, and we are sort of um, uh, achieving highly similar um, accuracies as, as the um, FVP plus software from Schrodinger. And with that, um, um, at the end, I'd like to thank all the people who did the work. So this PMX was started by Daniel Zeliker, who now works at um, Böhringer and is currently mostly done uh, by Vitas Kapsis, who did most of the, um, not only most of the PMX development, but also all the um, um, applications I shown today. And uh, Vance and Matteo have done um, uh, various other free energy related projects in the group. And yeah, thank you very much for your attention and happy to take further questions. Well, thank you very much. Uh, this was really impressive uh, set of data, really large data sets on everything, proteins and ligands. And this was, this was really nice. So I see uh, we have another question in the chat box, but before I'm gonna take advantage of my being host. And so now you looked at a lot of ligands uh, and different types of force fields. Was there any particular category of ligands that they're not coming out well. I don't know, for example, halogen containing things or, you know, the usual things people are yeah. trying to improve in the force field uh, uh, description of a small molecule. Was there any particular category that was particularly problematic in your experience? Yeah, so, I mean, yes, there are the, the yeah, different forms of chemistry that are better captured in, in some force yeah. fields than others, yeah. so. 
uh, and, and we see that also back in, in, in these cases. Um, but for me, the major surprise was actually that um, most of the scatter that we see here doesn't go back to that, but rather to issues with the, um, uh, with the receptor. Yes, so um, um, I see. there might be, a, a, you know, protonation state um, choices, there might be different um, receptor conformations, there might be there's one case that is heavily affected by dimerization and and you know the um, uh, ligand binding in one of the monomers but not in the other and and um, these kind of things that um, seem mm -hmm. to uh, uh, but of course there are force field issues yeah you can already appreciate from I think yeah you can nicely see it here that um, um, these these force fields actually um, uh, I mean, they show similarities, but if you would plot one versus the other, scatter would be larger than uh, plotting uh, uh, mm. simulation versus experiment. So again, mm. there is a lot to be learned also from uh, comparing these different force fields to each other. Absolutely. Miranal, are you still on? You want to ask your own questions? Question? Yeah, I think he answered my question during the talk. Uh, my question was about uh, what kind uh, like, is it, uh, how do you compare the kind of perturbation you do versus uh, traditional FAP? Does it work as good as traditional FAP for a larger perturbation or for a smaller kind of perturbation? So he answered that kind of question during his talk. Oh, I see. Right. That's correct. Yeah. That's true. That's true. So the, I have actually another question about PMX. In fact, I was going to ask you about the capabilities. So this is really generating all sorts of force fields for a small small ligand. Can you can you tell me tell us a little bit more about capabilities in PMX? I'm I'm really interested in it. Yeah. Okay. So for, for ligands what we do is we um we parameterize the um, uh, ligands with with um, open source force fields yeah so that could be GAF for yeah. amber style calculation CGNFF mm -hmm. for charm force mm -hmm. fields mm -hmm. and um, then of course you require a, a mapping of your ligands one onto the other so there we um, uh, we use two sorts of mapping so one is um, a common substructure um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, mapping I don't think I have a, a, a sort of a slide to to where it's all summarized and the other is a um, um, atom-based mapping and then we have a, a sort of heuristic to see which of the two mappings we prefer and that's right. the one we yeah. choose then mm -hmm. um, uh, we um, based on on these mapped topologies we um, um, we create a, a hybrid topology so that's this these topologies where you have these a and b states defined um, and those go straight into Gromax, where you then do the free energy calculation, switching right. A to B. Now, of course, here we do that both in solvent as well as in the receptor, and um, um, you know compute the delta G with um, uh, with a Crookes-like approach. Yeah. So right. all of these different steps are sort of mm -hmm. supported and and streamlined within PMX. So it's a it's a Python library of um, mm -hmm. commands. Um, and um, yeah, if you're somewhat familiar with Gromax, then, then PMX uses um, a lot of the same philosophy just yes. within a, a Python environment. So it's just gotcha. an add-on mm -hmm. where you have a number of, of command line tools that you know, allow you to, to script a whole workflow like this with hundreds of ligands, mm -hmm. does you know, everything from the parameterization of the ligands mapping of the um, of the topologies for the delta g calculations doing the actual calculations and then the post-processing of um, you know computing the um, 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 the free energies as well as the these correlations and so mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. great great very very nice very nice yeah Paul, so thank you so a, much uh -huh. Uh -huh. go ahead please yeah no just as um uh, as a um, tour de force or as a um, um, illustration, how, how well this scales. Um, we did um, a workflow like this of, of um, something like 500 um, ligands 
um, in three days on a supercomputer. So that's wow. um, that's of course a lot of calculations. Yeah. So behind all of those, uh, behind each of these points, um, are are something like five hundred um, um, simulations. Um, but uh, these things, of course, scale beautifully. So if you have a large enough machine, mm -hmm. uh, you can get a very decent uh, throughput. Yeah, absolutely. So I see another chat question asking, uh, did you ever address the delta G equals delta H minus T delta S versus thermodynamic integration thing? <laughs> yeah. Um, so that was uh, mm -hmm. uh, the, the one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, where was it? Um, it's in the beginning when we were introducing thermodynamic integration. Oh, yeah. Um, so here we have it, right? Oh, well, yeah. yeah, we have it here as well. So you can ask the, the very same thing for, for TI. So mm -hmm. where did the T delta S term go? Because you might think that this is just uh, the delta H term. Well, well, first thing to realize is that this H is not the uh, enthalpy, but this is the uh, Hamiltonian, right? But still, mm -hmm. it's just um, you know, involved with the interactions, uh, the um, force field terms that you have. And so um, this just evaluates the force field energy. So it is uh, concerned with the enthalpy. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the question is, where does the uh, T delta S term go? It's actually in these brackets over here. So yeah. the ensemble averaging makes sure that the entropic contribution is captured. Okay. Uh, and that's why um, you, know, you cannot do this based on an individual snapshot, but you require on really switching from an A state ensemble to a B state ensemble. Um, and, and that's where uh, the entropic contribution comes in. So even though Absolutely. it says um, H here, the T delta S is in the ensemble averaging. Yeah, exactly. Mohamed. Uh, I was wondering when you were uh, calculating the gradient of Hamilton with respect to Lambda, are you still using the soft core or hard core scheme or with this method, there's no problem like, you know, endpoint catastrophe? Yeah, no, uh, good point. So it's, um, as with any alchemical approach, it's always a good idea to um, to have a soft core um, switched on for intermediate lambdas. Um, we actually devised our own soft core because it's slightly uh, more robust uh, than, than others. But uh, in principle, any of the proposed um, uh, soft core functions in the literature will um, help you to to get a, a smoother transition from zero to one. So yeah, it's um, it should be switched on. So you're using the same uh, soft core function that is implemented in Gromax, where you're shifting based on the sigma of each atom group, or it's different from what it is in Gromax. Yeah, um, it, it, it actually it depends a little bit where we compute. So if we compute on clusters where only um, a vanilla Gromax is installed and we are not allowed to bring our own soft uh, uh, Gromax, then we use the, the one that is uh, included in vanilla Gromax, which is the original uh, Beutler uh soft core, which is the, um, uh, I think that may be the one that you're referring to. And uh, we have developed our own, um, which is, um, which acts on the force level and not on the potential level. So the, the default Gromax just um, switches the potential to a, a finite value. And what we do in our soft core is we switch the force to a finite value. So we just linearize the force, which has as an advantage that even if we approach uh, zero distance, for example, we don't uh, run into any issues. Um, uh, we still have a gradient um, um, you know, driving us away from, from that uh, point as it should. Uh, whereas the, the original soft core just goes to a flat line, which can lead to um, sometimes an additional minimum at that position. So um, yeah, that's just a small technical issue, but um, um, then um, uh, yeah. Uh, 
both actually work fine. It's just, you know, in the in the second digit of your accuracy, you will see uh, some of that effect that occasionally you you will see uh, um, a better converged answer with the with the new software as compared to the, the traditional one. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, uh, Leila. Yeah. Hi, Emma. Go this ahead. is Leila Vukovic. Go <laughs> um, ahead, Leila. Yeah, I was wondering if uh, are there any restraints imposed to preserve the crystal structure binding pose during these transitions, or do you not run into the problem of the ligand kind of changing too much from the binding pose because it's only the mutation is only a small part of it? Um, no, we don't use any restraints, so the ligand can do whatever it likes. Sometimes we also see a slight reorientation or you know moving into a, a slightly alternative binding pose. It could also unbind, and and um, you know in some of the cases we have seen that, especially in uh, in, in largely destabilizing uh, mutations. So in in fact, it's not unexpected then. Yeah, you know, if you destabilize it by more than the affinity, then the ligand is supposed to unbind. And so we actually want to capture that in the um, calculations. Um, it, it does become an issue if you want to do absolute binding free energy calculations. So we switch to those as well. And, and um, there you have a slightly different um, thermodynamic cycle. Um, so the, um, uh, then you would be switching on and off complete ligands instead of uh, just um, uh, morphing from, from one ligand derivative to another. And then of course, the, the, so if you, if you imagine this to be the, the dummy ligand that is completely switched off, of course that wants to unbind from the receptor um, in most cases. And, and that must be prevented because otherwise you don't have a proper reference state. Uh, so in those cases, um, uh, restraints must be applied, and that's a little bit, well, you know, technical on on how to best do that. But there are approaches in the literature that uh, uh, mostly work. <laughs> okay, thanks. Okay, well, it's quite late in Europe. Thank you very much, Bert. This was really uh, much better than I was hoping for. So it was a very thorough kind of seminar covering some fundamental and very good examples. And uh, this was very good. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation and giving us a seminar. We look forward to have you here physically at some point actually in Urbana Champagne once everything with this COVID-19 is over, hopefully. Uh, yeah, exactly. So the, uh, yeah. that would be the good news, right? The next time we meet again in person, that probably means the pandemic is under control. It's so over, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Let's hope for that. Thanks again. Uh, uh, and uh, I think we are done with the seminar. Thank you. All right. Thanks very bye -bye. much. Bye-bye.